Hallelujah. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 16, we'll read verses 16 uh, to 22, and then we'll go to verse 26. Uh, Luke chapter 14, the Bible says this in verse 16, it says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Verse 22 says, uh, I'm sorry, go back. It says, so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maim and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. Verse 26 says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's heavy, ain't it? <laughs> and the Bible says this, put back uh, verse 18 again. It says, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. Say excuse. The first one said unto him, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. Verse 19 says, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Say excuse. Say excuse. You know, because excuse. Excuses are the things that we say and do when we really don't want to do something. We started this year off talking about 1,440 minutes. That you have 1,440 minutes every day to do what God has accomplished for you to do that day. And some of you all are sleepers and you like to get your eight hours of sleep. And so if you add in your eight hours of sleep, you have 480 hours of sleep. And if you take that from your 1,440 hours a day, you're down to 960 minutes a day to do what God has called you to do. Turn to your neighbor and say, no more excuses. Say, no more excuses. Say, no more excuses. We'll pray. Father, we thank you today for being in this place today, oh God. We thank you for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard today, oh God. We thank you for the word that you have given for us today, today, oh God. For those who are looking online today, God, it's the same word today, the same anointing today, oh God. We just thank you today that you have given us 1,440 minutes every day today to do what you have called us to do today. That is the secret to success today, oh God using every minute 
like you have called us to use it today, God. We thank you today that as we go into the Word, we ask that the Word will be sown in the hearts and minds of those who are here today, causing increase in their life today, God. A hundredfold is what we declare today, Lord, and we just thank you for all that you're doing in our lives today, God. We thank you that it's just a blessing to be here today, oh God. We thank you that our family is well today, oh God. We thank you that we speak life into every situation today, God. We speak peace into every situation today, God. We will not be here and don't come here empty-handed today, God. Come, we've come with praise in our mouth today, God. We've come with thanksgiving in our heart today, oh God, because you have been good to us. And Lord, we just come thanking you and praising you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may take your seats, amen. Hallelujah. You know, last week we talked about organization. And so organization are the incremental steps that God will give you in order to carry out the plan that he has given you this year. But if God has taken the time to give you you a plan and he's given you purpose, he's given you organization, but you keep using excuses as to why you can't carry out what God has called you to do, you are 100% sure that it is God talking to you, but there's there's this disease that has taken a lot of God's people. Uh, And it can be debilitating and it can incapacitate a lot of people. And I'm not talking about a physical disease. I'm talking about a mental, spiritual disease called excuses. And so I just kind of looked up some quick statistics because uh, I I knew that I I would be speaking today. And there are 15 million people who have been touched by cancer in any given year. There's 100 or 1 million people who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's in any given year. There's 1 million people who have been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in any given year. Those are debilitating, incapacitating diseases. But what I'm talking about this morning is just as incapacitating and just as debilitating as a physical disease. Y'all don't want to talk to me. It's something that when you say in your mind, I don't want to do that, and then you come up with a reason that on face value looks to be justification as to why you don't do it, it keeps you hidden. It it keeps you from accomplishing what God has called you to accomplish. Is that making sense to anybody in here today? And so I've known and you know people that uh, there are great men and women that are athletes that have things going on in their life, but they still go out whenever practice is called to do what they've been called to do because they have decided I will not make any excuses. What God wants you to accomplish this year, you can't do it and make excuses at the same time. Turn to your neighbor and say this, you can't make money and make excuses in the same day. So if you're going to make money, then you need to make money, but you can't make money and make excuses as to why you can't make money because God is calling you to higher living this year. But it's going to take something on the inside of you to overcome every excuse because the hurdles of excuse are going to come. And you're going to have to go over every single one to get what God has for you this year. Years ago, I read a book by Tony Evans, and it was called No More Excuses. And it was actually written to, to men. And, and for uh, leadership of Power Pack, you know the book because I actually bought that book and I gave it to every leader in our Power Pack men's group because I wanted them to read it because I wanted it to change their lives the way it changed my life. Because a lot of reasons that we say we can't do something are just excuses. Amen, amen. If you want to be delivered and you want to stay delivered, you're not going to be able to use any excuses as to why you can no longer do what God has called you to do, as to why you can no longer walk in the liberty that God has called you to walk in, as to why you can no longer go after the plan that God has given you to run after. Say excuses. 
Excuses can be one of the most debilitating, incapacitating things that we've ever come across. There are people with far less than you and they do more than you because of the excuses. Is this making sense? And so it is a mental disease that you won't find in the ICD-10, the International Classification of Diseases. You won't, you won't find excuses in there. You won't find it in the DSM, the, 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 the book that they use to diagnose mental disorders. It won't be there. But, but I did find this word in the dictionary. It was called excusitis. So although it wasn't a medical term, it did make the dictionary. Excusitis, and I want to read this because excusitis is the regular behavior of a mediocre person who continually makes excuses for poor performance. These are typically excuses that are not made by successful people. It's the regular behavior. So it's just not one excuse. That's, that's why I said this, this is something that's habitual and it's, it's, it's disease worthy. The regular behavior of a mediocre person who continually makes excuses for poor performance that are not typically excuses that are made by successful people. This morning, God has brought you here to actually give you a spiritual examination, to give you a mental examination. Some people going into the end of the year, you get your physical, and some people wait until the beginning of the year to get your annual physical. And so I just want to give you a mental physical this morning. So I'm not going to ask you to roll up your sleeve and expose the injection site so you can get this vaccination, but I am going to ask you to open up your heart and receive this vaccination that God wants to give you this morning of excusitis. Say excusitis. Say excusitis. And so I looked up the word excusitis and I looked up itis just by itself. And itis simply means inflammation. If you have bronchitis, that means your lungs are inflamed. If you have appendicitis, that means your appendix is it flame. If you have arthritis, that means there's inflammation in your joints. And these are the things that cause us not to be as mobile as we need to be. If you have excusitis, that's inflammation in your life and it's not causing you to be as mobile as you need to be. Y'all don't want to say man in here. And so that's why God is calling us today to say we've got to do something about all these excuses that we use. Is this making sense? I'm a pastor. I love God's people, but I don't heard some excuses. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one. Pastor, 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 I want to be a greeter. I want to be a greeter, but my legs hurt. And sometimes I'm not able to stand like I want to stand. I say, okay, let's pray about that thing. And then I see them in line at the Dave Chappelle. Standing in line. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. Pastor, pastor, I, I don't want to come to church because I have this concern about COVID. And you know what? I understand that, hey, COVID was real for all of us. But don't let me see you in Vegas masked up. And you couldn't come to church because of COVID, but you can go to Vegas for a weekend and you double mask. Because I would think, why don't you wear your... Say excuse. And when you do that, it becomes chronic. And then it holds you back. And it's just not an excuse, it's excusitis, because now it's as, part, as much a part of your life as anything else you do. I wish you could get this today. It could be the reason you don't have your degree is because you had excuses. 
When you had the opportunity to go, you didn't want to go to school, and now you even think, like, could I go to school right now? And then you start making excuses. When I went back to get my master's, I was probably 35 years old. I was the only per oldest person in the class. And, and, and I had to deal with that. But I decided I was not going to make any more excuses. Because when I would go to class, I would feel the pressure of being the oldest person in the class because I would come off uh, work and I would still be kind of in my suit and tie and everybody, all the young kids there in their Georgia looking around at me like, who is this? Is he the professor? <laughs> but I was after something. And I wasn't going to let even my own mind make the excuse for me not to be there. Is this making sense? This morning, we're after that mental hurdle that you have that keeps you in the same place year after year after year. And, and some of you use excuses just like you use soap and water. You use it every single day. You got more excuses than a, a man talking to his girlfriend about why you ain't got married yet. When she asks, like, why are we getting married? You, you just roll them, you just roll them off because I got to clean up my credit and I got to get out of debt and I, I got to get another job and I got, you, they, they, they just manifest. It's chronic. God wants to spend time with you. And you have an excuse why you can't spend time with God. The Bible says this, Luke chapter 14 the Bible says in verse 16, it says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Isn't this something that the plan is intact? God had a plan for them. The servant had a plan for everybody that he knew. And so, and this is what you have to understand about the scriptures, that before the party was made, the invitations were made, and the people on the other end at one point in time said, yeah, I'm going to do that. Because that's the way excuses work. You say you're going to do something, and then when it comes time to doing it, you come up with this reason why you can't, you can't do it. Is this making sense? And, and so the party was made, and this, and this is the thing about anyone who's ever had a party, you would think that if I go through the expense of getting the food, and I go through the expense of getting the wine, and I go through the expense of everything that we need, and all you got to do is just show up, you think that would be one of the easiest things you could ever do because I have gone through all of the expense to make this thing happen. So the invitations went out and everybody started coming back with excuses. Not to attend the servants or the master's party. Don't you know that God wants to throw a party for you? He has went through all the expense. All he wants you to do is just have the courage to show up and enjoy yourself at his table. He's taking care of everything. How dare we say, like, I don't have time because of this, and I don't have time because of that, and I don't have time because of this. God is the one who's given you life. Say excuses. And so the Bible says this, verse 18. Oh, this is where we get to it. It says, and they all with one consent begin to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And this is the thing about excuses is that when someone gives you an excuse and even when we give an excuse to God on face value, it looks legitimate until you begin to inquire further. When I read this scripture, what, what popped out to me is they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first one said, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs to go see it. He says, I, I've got to go inspect this thing. And what dawned on me is who buys a piece of property and you haven't already inspected it? 
See, on face value, it looks like, okay, it's a legitimate need until you inquire further because nobody buys property that you haven't already checked it out. If, if you did, that's not the way this thing works. You're supposed to go and inspect it first. Is this making sense? But when you're looking and reaching for an excuse, you just, you just reach for whatever. And, and so actually what he is saying is, I've, I've got this land, and this land is more important than coming to the party. The materiality that I have, the, the, the goods that I have, keeps me from coming to the party that God has for me. That's going to sink in in a minute. Some of us have materialitis. Under excusitis, we have all these other different categories. And one of them is materialitis because God has been so good until he has blessed you with things. He's blessed you with material things. And now all of a sudden... You spend more time worshiping the material thing than you do coming to worship God. It's called material-itis. Now that I have a car, I got to watch the car instead of spending time with God. And now that I have a house, now I have to spend my time doing things in the house instead of spending time with God and God's people. And now that he's blessed me with clothes, it takes more of my time to get dressed and all of these things that come with material possessions. And so, oh God. As a pastor, sometimes I, I pray uh, and sometimes I hate when people get blessed because when you get blessed, sometimes you don't know how to act when you get blessed because you begin to change because you get materialitis. I can't come to church because I got a dust. That dust on your coffee table is going to be there when you get back. From church, I guarantee you, if you don't do it right now, it's still going to be there when you get back. I, I can't come to church because I, I got to clean my car. I guarantee you, you ain't going to like this, but I'm going to tell you, you can drive the dirty car on the parking lot and ain't nobody going to even care. They're not going to say like, ooh, look at, okay, for six weeks in a row, she had a clean car. I wonder what's going on with her because she got a dirty car today. Don't nobody even Materialitis. I got a little stuff now. And now it changes my relationship with God. Because God gave me an initial invitation and I accepted it. And now he's saying, come on to a party that I've got for you. And now you're saying, oh, no, no. Because in, bet in between the time that you gave me the initial invitation until now you're calling me saying, come, I've got this piece of property now. And now it's, 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 it's consuming my life. It, it has come and now materialitis has brought inflammation. And now it's squeezing out the time and the space that I once had for God because now things are inflamed. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. And the time and space you used to have for God, you don't have it anymore. And you ask yourself, where did all my time go? It went to your material things. Is this making sense? Oh, but we're just not going to stop there. We're just not going to stop there because the Bible says in verse 19, it says, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them, I pray thee have me excused. He said, you know what? I just bought five yoke of oxen, and now I got to go prove them. Once again, I'm not from the country. I'm not from the country. I, I must confess, I've spent my whole life living in the city. I, I don't know about, about country living, but I do have fem family members who lived in the country. And, and I know some of you have lived in the country. And I don't think you'd ever buy a horse without first examining the horse. I don't think you'd buy a cow without first examining the cow. So he said, I bought five yoke of oxen and now I got to go prove them. Who buys oxen that are not already proven? So, so what he is saying is, I, I got to go to work. 
Say work itis. <laughs> I, I, I got this job that 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 I that I I I, I got to go to work. I, God, I just don't have time for you the way that I used to have time for you because now I got double time. I got triple time. If I work in the evenings, I get a shift differential, and so if I work on Sunday, I got I get double time. And, and so now I know the invitation is coming, but I just don't have time because I got to go to work. I got to go to work. And, and if I was off on Sunday, but if I can make more money doing something on Sunday, I'm going to do that too because work is wealth itis. It's like, I got to have, I got to have this money. I got to have it. Well, whenever you come into the room, people hear that OJ song like, doom, 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 because you've got to have it. And if working is what gets you the money, then that's what you're going to do. And you'll work more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And in some cases, you still won't have anything to show for it. God is saying, I was the one who blessed you with that job. Because you asked me for a job. He said, I didn't think you'd go crazy like that. Say work itis. It's Sunday morning. What you gonna do? It's Wednesday evening. What are you gonna do? And you say, God, I don't have time to spend with you because I gotta work. But when it came time to watching two football games back after back for six hours, you got time. God, I don't have time to read one chapter today, but when it came time to binging out on Netflix, you had this mysterious time that just, that just showed up. And, and some of you all, it, you know it's 1030. You're like, just one more episode, one more episode. I know I have to go to work in the morning, but just one more episode because I'm just going fast. And then the next thing you know, it's 1115, and you're like, just, just one more episode because I'm so close to the end. And God is saying, one more episode or one chapter? Do, do you know if you read about five chapters in your Bible a day, you could read your Bible in a year? Five to six chapters a day? For all of the people who come to me, Pastor Randy, I just need this, I need a Bible reading plan. I, I just, if you read five to six chapters a day, you could get it done in a year. We have time to work, but we don't have time to work on our relationship with God. So we have materialitis and, and we have workitis, and it all falls under excuseitis. That's why you need to be vaccinated and boosted. Because once you are delivered, it's going to come back. It's going to come back knocking on the door, and that's why you need your booster. Say, I need a booster. And the Bible says this, verse 20. It says, and another said, I have married a wife, and therefore, I can't come. Oh, Lord. Let me help you with this. The Bible says this in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5, and you can highlight this because this, this is where this, this person is coming from. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5, it says, When a man had taken a new wife, he shall not go, go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife. We all know what that means. Which he hath taken. So, so when you got married, Old Testament times, they said in the book of Deuteronomy that you were off for an entire year. That was your honeymoon while, while you all put two lives together as one life. So, so you were excused from fighting. You were excused from this. You were excused from that because, because after all, you got a, a new wife. And, and there is a such thing as, as marriage-itis. You were doing okay till you got boo. And then when you got boo, we don't see you. I'm trying to help him. (laughs) 
Pastor Randy, I just love the Lord. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. You loved him when you were single as a Pringle. But then when you jumped out there on Christian Mingle and you found somebody, and, and I'm praying that maybe it turns into to, uh, marriage, but do you know a lot of people have put other people ahead of their relationship with God? Pastor Randy, Sunday morning is the only time that we're both off together, and, and I like to make uh, her pancakes and breakfast in bed, and, and, and Pastor Randy, I like to take my wife out on picnics, and I like to do this, and, and I like to... God is calling an assembly. He's calling a party, and he says, this is what you tell the married couple, you can do that anytime. You can do it in the morning. You can do it in the midday. You can do it at night. You can do it at midnight. Some of y'all, the bell just went off of what I'm really talking about. You, so, so he's like, I like, I mean, we, we are at home. We are in love. We are, we are having a good time. You can have a good time anytime because you're married. Sometimes people allow marriage-itis, which turns into pleasure-itis, to affect their relationship with God. Yes. Pleasures. This is what I like to do. We, we're going to go to the amusement park, and, and we're going to go to the theater, and we're getting ready to go over here, and we're getting ready to go boating, and we're getting ready to go sailing, and, and we're getting ready to go skiing, and we're getting ready. You find all of these things to do, but you don't do them on your time. You do them on God's time. Is this making sense? So, Pastor Randy, should I get a vacation? Absolutely, you should get a vacation. Pastor Randy, do I need to, can I, can I uh, 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 go visit my mama? Absolutely, you go visit your mama. But if you visit your mama every Sunday morning when you should be doing something for God, you can't visit your mama Sunday afternoon? No, I don't want to visit my mama Sunday afternoon because Sunday afternoon I want to go home and be able to watch. So I would rather go Sunday morning because it frees me to do what I want to do Sunday afternoon. Pastor Randy, you preaching good. I know I am. I'm trying to help you. All seriousness, all seriousness. You should not want and you should not allow anybody to get in between your relationship with God. I'm married, been married for 30 years. One of the things that Tarsha knows about me is that I will not allow her to get in between my relationship with God. And one of the things I know about her is that she will not allow me to get in, in between her relationship with God. I wish I would start saying we ain't going to go to church today because I want you to make some pancakes and stuff for me. She'd be like... Boy, stop. You know that's not even how we roll. Let, let me go to God's house, get this blessing, and, and come back so that this house would be blessed. Are you crazy? Well, you don't spend no time with me. I'm going to church for an hour and a half. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Say materialitis. Say workitis. Say marriage itis. The Bible says, Luke chapter 14, verse 26, it says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yes, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. So, so, so what does that mean? That means I have to hate them? No, it's not meaning you have to hate them, but you just don't allow them to get in between you and your relationship with God. Because this is the same Bible that says honor your mother and father, right? This is the, this is the first commandment with promise. So it's not saying that you, you hate them to the degree that you don't talk to them, you hate them. No, no, no. It's just things. It's just priority. God first. God first. 
See, see, that's why. See, you got to be vaccinated. Become, some of us keep God first when we don't have nothing else. But if we get a little money in our pockets, get a little change in our pockets, get a nice car that we're driving, and, and now you get a little boo on the side, somebody that you don't have to stay home on Friday night no more. Paint your toenails. Now somebody wants to spend some time with you. And now you're like, now you got this decision. Do, do, I, do I go with them or do I stay with God? Someone like, well, Pastor Randy, what should I do? You already know. You all, you all, you already know. And so, so now we've talked about Luke chapter 14, and we talked about all of the people who had excuses and why they couldn't come. And so I, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about us. 1440. We have 1440 minutes. This is the key to a successful year. You you can't get involved in the itis. Number one, lazy itis. Oh, Lord. The Bible says this, Proverbs chapter 10, I'm getting ready to go a little bit faster. It says, verse four, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. You can't make money and make excuses at the same time. So if you want to have lazy itis, I know you want to make declarations and I, want you, I know you want to declare a thing. And, but if you don't put your hands to anything, it's not going to happen. So, so if you think like, oh, I don't have to do anything, I'm just going to go in the gas station, I'm getting ready to buy this one little ticket and it's going to set me up for life. Everybody wishes that would happen. But in the meantime, you're going to have to put your hands to doing something. Turn to your neighbor and say, stay away from the disease of lazy-itis. Girlfriend, girlfriend, if he wasn't working when y'all were dating, that's a sign. I better leave that alone. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24 says, diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. See, you can have results or you can have excuses, but you can't have them both. The Bible says this. I'm going to read this and we're going to go to the next point. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30. It says, I went past the field of a sluggard, lazy, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense because sometimes lazy people don't have common sense because lazy people make the excuse that that person doesn't like me and I can't succeed because of my color. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me in here. I can't succeed because of this and that and this and that and this and that. And you ain't picked up a shovel. You ain't picked up a hammer. You haven't picked up anything. And you want me to believe the reason that you're in the situation that you're in is because of somebody else. No, remember the Bible says this. It says you can't be a disciple unless you hate mother, father, sister, brother, and even yourself. Because we're the ones who put us in positions that aren't good. I've heard this said before, and it always stuck with me. This quote says, when you are born, you come out looking like your parents. But when you die, you look like your decisions. So, so, so it's nobody's fault. Laziness is nobody's fault but yours. When I was a teenager and I was living at home with my parents, my dad said, man, you need to get a job. And I said, okay. And, and then he would come home for lunch because he was a letter carrier. He would come home for lunch. I don't know how he was able to come home for lunch, but that's another, that's another story. And when he would come home for lunch, at 12 o'clock, I had just got up at 11. He's like, did you find a job? But he didn't know that I just got up at 11 because I pretended like I was up already. Uh, but how many know, you can't find a job at noon. You got to knock early. So the Bible says thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall 
The thorns had come up. The ground was covered with weeds. The land that God has given you because of you being lazy, and it's not that God hadn't blessed you with something, but he's wanting you to manifest more than what he gave you, but he's not going to do it all. Thorns had came up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. The Bible says this, I applied my heart to what I observed and I learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man, like a bandit. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, poverty is coming. And then you're going to want us to rebuke it off of you. And, and I can't rebuke off of you laziness. In the name of Jesus, this lazy spirit be gone. No, 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 no. That's something that you're going to have to, to, to do. Ooh, y'all don't want to hear me this morning. Next to laziness, which is, I don't want to do it, you've got slothfulitis, which says, when I do it, I'm going to do it as slow as I can. <laughs> laziness says, I don't want to do it. Slothfulitis says, if I'm made to do it, I'm going to do it as long, as slow as I can. Is this making sense? Do, do you remember when you were 16 and your mama asked you to wash dishes and you were in the kitchen for like two hours? Watching, washing eight plates and six glasses because you didn't really want to do it? Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, so I'm just, I'm just going to take my time and do it. And this is the thing. You have wasted part of your 960 minutes because it only should have taken you an hour. And then your mama calls and says, are you still in that kitchen? It's been three hours. The Bible says this, Proverbs 18, 9, it says, one who is slack in his work is a brother to one who destroys. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, it says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And this scripture was written because some people work better when their supervisor is around. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Where's the super ad, supervisor at today? Well, they called in sick. Oh, shoo. Oh, oh, but he came in. He came in. And you call yourself a Christian. The Bible says this, verse 24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. He said, work heartily as if you are working for Christ, because in actuality, you are. God is your real boss. That's why it doesn't matter if you have a fleshly boss who don't like you, because they can do whatever they want to do to you, but it still will not keep the big boss, the real boss, from blessing you. Can I get an amen in here? Because you can have people on your job, they may not like you, but that still doesn't have stop the blessing from coming. I was blessed in spite of haters. I was blessed in spite of naysayers. I was blessed in spite of people who didn't like me. I just got my hands busy what I believe God had called me to do, and blessings come, and they couldn't stop it, and that made them even more mad. Like, man, look, you cannot curse what God has blessed. You can't do it. Say tired, itis. You talk to some people, oh, Lord, I'm tired. And that's their excuse for not doing anything. I'm tired. I'm so tired. I'm tired. The Bible says this for all of the tired folks. Matthew chapter 11. 
Come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give. You don't have to have tired itis. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Should you get your rest? Yes, you should get your rest. So when God whispers in your ear, turn this television off and go to bed and get your rest, and you still binging, that's not his fault. That's your fault. Is this making sense? So, so some of us are tired, but it's, it's our fault. So now God is asking you to do something. You're like, man, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Ooh. Isn't it something like we're always tired when God wants us to do something? But then when we go home, we get this extra burst of energy like, like where did it come from? The, is, am I the only person who's ever experienced that? Like, Lord, ask me to do something. I'm so tired. And then as soon as I get home, I'm like, I went to Bible study. I was so tired. But as soon as I got home, I'm like, oh, I wonder what's on TV. Oh, the game is on. Now I got strength till 1130 till the game goes off. A double header, West Coast games. Until finally I had to say, this might be the devil. <laughs> because then when I woke up at 5.45, 6 o'clock, on the way to work trying to shower, now I'm tired, but it wasn't anybody's fault but mine. Psalms chapter 62, verse 1 Write this down because this is good. It says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Amen. 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 Is it your habits that are making you tired? Are you stressing over things that God has plainly told you to let it go? Is that what's making you tired. You have all this anxiety. And the scripture says, don't take a thought for anything. You can't make yourself taller. You can't make yourself shorter. He says, if God knows how to take care of the birds and the lilies in the field, surely he knows how to take care of you. Are you tired because you're carrying something that you don't need to be carrying in the first place? Because now I've stopped talking about people who are physically tired. I'm talking to the emotionally tired. You are drained because you are carrying things that you should not be carrying in the first place. You got mama's problems. You got daddy's problems. You got your kids' problems. You got all these problems on you, and, and you can't handle any of them. The Bible says in 1 Peter Chapter 5, it says, verse 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, hold God to his word. That, that's what you do. You hold God to his word. And so when we leave tired itis, we come to procrastinitis. These are all my people who can't maintain focus. You are the kid that sits in the classroom, the teacher is instructing you, but you're looking out the window. Daydreaming. Instead of working, you're dreaming. And when that dream doesn't work, you get another dream. And instead of working, you get another dream. And instead of being productive, you get another dream. And instead of being consistent over here, you get another dream. So anything that keeps you away from doing what God really wants you to do, you, your attention span is that long. Just procrastinating. Only to come to the realization that whatever you procrastinated from today is still going to be there tomorrow. So you might as well do it today. The scripture says in John chapter 9, verse 4, it says, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. 
Night is coming when no one can work. King James Version says, I must work the works while it is day because night cometh and nobody can work. There's no sense in procrastinating over something today. Just go ahead and do it. Turn your neighbor and say, just go ahead and do it. Stop procrastinating. You could have been on down the road if you would have just done it last year. Like, I'm waiting on God. No, God is waiting on you. You keep talking about what you're going to do, and you're going to do it tomorrow. Tomorrow is this mystical land where 99% of all productivity, motivation, and human achievement is stored. It's stored tomorrow, and you never get to it today. Amen. Some people are daydreaming their life away. Tomorrow, I'm going to do this. What are you doing today? And we leave procrastinitis and we get to ageitis. And I want to spend a little bit of time here. I'm too old to do what God is calling me to do right now. No, 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 no. You're never too old. Amen, Pastor Randy. I, I, couldn't, get no, I couldn't get no amens from, from. You're never too old or too young to do what God has called you to do. The thing that I've noticed about older people, that sometimes they think less of themselves as they get older compared to what they thought of themselves when they were younger. They think they talk slower and they think that they walk slower and they think that. But here's the deal. If you talk slower, it just means that there's more wisdom in what you're saying. If, if, if you walk slower, it means that we all need to get on your pace because obviously it's worked for you. And so I might need to get off of the treadmill of life and I might need to get your pace because it's, it's working for you. And, and so you're like, I, I'm too old. I don't know if I can do this. And so I, I thought that once I, I got to be a certain age, I was going to retire. I thought retirement was in my future. And God, so have you ever read in scripture where God said, okay, you're old enough now to retire? I haven't read it. Because in Christianity, you don't retire. Now, your assignment might be changed, but your retirement turns into a refirement. So, so he gives you a boost for doing something else. You may not do what you used to do, but you can still do something. In your 960 minutes when you're not sleeping. Is this making sense? The, the Bible says this in Psalm chapter 92, verse 13. It says, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. So just because you're 55, 65, 75, 85, 95, that doesn't mean that God hasn't called you to do something. Like, well, I, I, I want it to work, and I want it to work hard, and I want it to retire. No, 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 no. Retirement, the way you think it and define it, is not in your future. So those are the people that say, I'm too old. What about the people who say, I'm too young? God can't use me because I'm too young. What you are actually saying is, I don't want God to use me because I still want to do some stuff. You're, you're looking at someone who was called to ministry at 25 years old, right? That's when I was ordained. But I was actually leading Bible studies and teaching Sunday schools before then. So, so, so you're looking at somebody who just didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. Is this making sense? But I had to make a decision that I want God to use me at 25 and 24 and 23 and 22 and 21. I didn't celebrate my 21st birthday the way that a lot of 21-year-olds celebrate their 21st birthday. Oh, I know this is good now. Because I, I got you to stop. You started thinking like, how did I celebrate my 21st? Uh, you remember how you celebrated 
But I realized this. God, you've been too good to me. At 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And I had to make a decision that I've noticed that some older people still had made. Like, God, I want you. I want you more than anything else. If this is the course, this is the path that you have called me to, then I accept it willingly. Everybody's not called into pastoral ministry. Other people may be called into different things. Whatever your ministry is, then you need to do what God has called you to do. But I said, hey, hey, God, if you called me into this, then I want to do it. I want to do the best job that I can because this is an assignment that comes with people looking at your lifestyle. That's the thing. That's why everybody can't do it. I can't give you godly advice and then I go against the advice that I've given you. You, you can't catch me ducking out of somebody's house just because you thought pastorship was lucrative and you can make some more money because I'm tired of being a plumber. I'm tired of being an electrician. I'm tired. I want to be a pastor. No, if you ain't called to this, don't run up here. If you're young, God wants to use you. You're like, well, I still want to have fun. You can still have fun and still be young and still be a Christian. Paul told Timothy this. Put my next verse up. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Paul gave Timothy this advice because Timothy was a very young pastor. Timothy was leading a church, and the people in the church, people were older than him. They wanted to give him advice of what they thought was right and what. And so Paul and Timothy had to talk, and so he said, don't let anybody belittle you because you're young. God has called you to this. If he's called you to this, then he will take care of you. What God ordains, he will maintain. So whatever you think you're lacking... Go to God. Let me give you this last one or two and then we're done. Health-itis. Say health-itis. I would do this, but I'm, man, my back is hurting. My toe is hurting. I got a headache. Uh, you just don't know what the condition is that I have. It's not very, very long that you are around people, and you can tell what they got because have you ever noticed that people that got issues, they always tell you? And then there are other people who might have the same issue, and you never know they have the issue because they never magnify it. They never go ahead and talk about it. They're like, I got the same thing you got, but you'll never know. But, but it's a, you can get around some people, be five minutes in the conversation, they're going to talk to you about their back. And that's why I can't do what God has called me to do. And so the Christians stump their toe and they can't come to Joe. Oh, my toe hurt. Well, it's not going to stop you tomorrow. It's not going to stop you from going to the soccer game, the basketball practice. It ain't going to stop you from going anywhere that you want to go. Ooh, I, I felt like the spirit had just changed. I feel I could be further along in life had I not been diagnosed with this. Are you going to let that stop you from doing what God has called you to do? With every breath in you, you ought to be able to give him praise. So, so, so you might have been diagnosed with this, or it might be an acute attack of this, or it might be chronic, but if you are still here, you should still give God praise for what he has called and allowed you to do. This was the point I was going to make earlier. There are professional athletes that have type 2 diabetes, but it has not stopped them from going out doing what God has called them to do. I don't know how many people ever heard of Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe won three grand slams. He had diabetes, but he kept it moving. And you're like, oh, Lord, I got this, and I don't know, I don't know how I'm going. You're going to take one step at a time, right? You're going to take your medication, and then you're going to still come to the celebration. 
right? So, so you're going to take your medication, and then you're going to still give God everything that's due him because you are still here. You are still alive. And you're not going to fall prey to health-itis. Like, I can't do this now because my knee hurts and, and my hip hurts and, and my ankle hurts and, and, and I can't hardly see at night. And Well, what can you do? Why are you still here? God had you here for a reason. Boy, y'all look out on cuss. I almost felt like Florida Evans. I felt that Florida Evans spirit coming up. <laughs> oh, somebody just got it. They just, they just got like Florida Evans good times. You know, she had this famous thing that she would, she, okay. Elect. Itis, I don't have the intellect. There are other people that are smarter than me. There will always be people that are smarter than you. Do what God has called you to do. Amen? Fear itis. Let's just get to the root of it. I'm scared. I have a phobia. I have, I have fear. Fear itis. God said, God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind. And so as often as fear comes, this is what you need to be quoting to yourself. God has not given me. Hey, we want you to do that presentation in front of everybody at work. Oh, Lord, I don't know how I can do it. And then one thought says, hey, if you do this and you're a five star, somebody's going to look at you. You might get promoted. And then the other thought says, you can't do that. You can't stand in front of people. What you need to be saying is God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And if they ask me to do it, then maybe they see what God already knows that I have on the inside of me. I'm getting ready to step up to the podium. I'm getting ready to knock it out the park. Fearitis. Do, do you know why we're talking to people in our children's ministry even now about having your kids know, uh, memorize scripture? They need to be having Easter speeches. They need to get up in front of people right now so that when they get to be 22, they won't be afraid of getting up in front of people. They're like, this ain't nothing to me. I got up and I did six Easter speeches in six years in a row. I'm ready for this. Instead of coming up here terrified, everybody starts there, but we don't end there. Say fear itis. And the last one, is unbelief itis. You've got to be vaccinated from this. I know it may happen for everybody else, but I don't know if it's going to happen for me. I know what the scripture says, but I don't know if it's really going to happen for me. We'll stand on our feet. Because I don't know if I really believe that God loves me that much. That will happen for me. God has delivered me, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to maintain what he delivered me from. Is this making sense? Amen. Earlier when I said you need the spiritual vaccination and you're going to need to be boosted, because the day you believe, tomorrow unbelief is going to come knocking at the door. Remember the man cried out to Jesus and he said, I believe, but help thou. That was the first time in scripture it dawned on me that you can believe and still have unbelief. It's, it's not either or, sometimes it's both. I believe, but there's still a part of me that still has unbelief. I don't, I don't know if you're going to work it out for me. I know Sister Jones gave her testimony about what you did, and I know Brother Smith gave a testimony about what you did, and what you delivered them from are the same things that I have, but I don't know if you're going to do it for me. I'm here to tell you, yes, he will do it for you. You're just going to have to believe for it. The Bible says in the book of Mark, I'll leave you with this scripture. 
Well, this is Mark chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Mark chapter 11, the Bible says, verse 23, one of my favorite, favorite scriptures. It says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and don't doubt in his heart, but believe the things that he says will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Whatever it is, begin to speak that thing. It, it clearly says, if you speak it, you believe it, don't have doubt in your heart when you say it, you shall have whatever it is you believe for. I want you to have success this year. Whatever success looks like for you. I want you to have success this year. But success is what comes after you stop making excuses. When you lose your excuses, you'll find success. Some people are going around the same mountain because of either tired-itis, health-itis, age-itis, procrastinitis, whatever it is. That's why God wanted to touch on a lot of things today. There might be some things that we didn't even cover, but you know it's an excuse. Ask God to deliver you from it. Because you can't be successful in whatever God is calling you to if you put up excuses yourself. And you're like, oh, I just feel so bad. I feel so bad because I have these excuses. Let me tell you this. You're in good company and you just don't even realize how close you are to this breakthrough that God wants to give you. When God called Moses, Moses came with an excuse. He said, I don't talk well. When God talked to Adam, Adam came with an excuse. He's like, it's this woman that you gave me. When God talked to Eve, Eve said she had an excuse. It was, this, it was the serpent who beguiled me. When God called Gideon, Gideon said, man, we're poor. I don't know how you're going to use me, God. And I'm the least in my family. How are you going to use me? When God called Jeremiah, Jeremiah came with excuses. It comes with the territory until you learn how to overcome them. So for everybody who's had an excuse, God wants to deliver you. He still wants to use you. Lift your hands. I just want to pray with you. Yes, God. The reason you can't move is because you have too much inflammation. From some of the things that we have resurrected and erected in our lives. You're fighting yourself. I'm going to leave you with this. Do you know that people with rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, <laughs> their, their body has sensed that there's some type of intruder in the body. So, so, so the body has now sent all the white blood cells to fight off what they perceive is in the body. The only problem is for folks with rheumatoid arthritis, there's nothing there. So, so all the white blood cells begin to attack good tissue. And that's why it begins to expand. And that's why some people have autoimmune situations because the body is attacking itself. It's looking for a foreign object to attack so that it'll make you better, but there's nothing there. Excuseitis is you attacking you over something that is not there. And now your life is inflamed. And you can't take the steps that you want to take. Just making sense. In fact, if you have an autoimmune situation, diagnosis, I want to pray for you 
after service today. Are you available to help uh, pray? So meet me over here. So you're like, hey, I have arthritis. I have lupus. I have any of these autoimmune. I, I just want to pray with you. To ask God to help you so that your body stops attacking itself. Does this make sense? Lift your hands. Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you today for blessing us. We thank you for giving us the courage to put into practice what we have heard today, God. God, the next time we come up with an excuse, we're asking you that you would help us, remind us of this word today. When we want to procrastinate, remind us of this word. When we say that we're too old or too young, remind us of this word. God, we thank you that all things that you have for us are good. We thank you that there will be growth, that there will be maturity today, God, in all that we do. We thank you that as we leave this place, you're touching us even now, God, in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls today, God, that we'll be able to walk in what you have called us to walk in today, Lord. We thank you for all that you're doing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Give God praise in here. Yes, God. If you don't know Jesus, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Just repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come as a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. I confess of all of my sins. I repent of all of my sins and I believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead just for me father in your word you said that if I would confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead I would be saved father I thank you for it right now in Jesus name amen give God praise in here Come on, you can do better than that. Give God praise in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We really appreciate you supporting our broadcast. And if you've never had an opportunity to join us in person, if you're in the Oklahoma City area, we want to invite you to Impact Community Church. We're located at 4400 Northwest Expressway in the Cole Community Center. We have something for everybody in your family. Bring your kids, bring the entire family. I know they will love Impact. If you would like to sow into Impact Community Church, you can give on our website by mail or text to give. The information is on the screen. Thank you for your support.